going to talk about classical conditioning, one aspect of your chapters on uh, learning today. Classical conditioning was discovered quite a while ago, and it was discovered by a Russian physiologist, not a psychologist, but a physiologist, Ivan Pavlov. And like so much research, he kind of stumbled onto it, studying some other stuff. Classical conditioning is learning that takes place where we're always building something new, something learned on top of an existing biological reaction. For example, uh, we have inborn patellar reflex. So when I hit my knee at a certain spot, my leg automatically goes out. That would be something we could condition, and so we could learn, for example, to sound a bell after each time, or just before each time that that patellar reflex was hit, and eventually just sounding the bell would cause the patellar reflex to, to happen. And that seems a little bit odd. Where we're heading with this today is to talk about a particular case of little Albert, but I've got some background that I need to give you here. If you look at classical conditioning, uh, it was uh, looked at first by Pavlov, and it has a, this kind of a pattern. And this pattern I'm going to put up here is different than what your book shows, and I think this is much clearer in explaining what happens and also explains the time order that your book doesn't have. You have an unconditioned stimulus. So that's an unconditioned stimulus. What does that mean? Big fancy words for it's an unlearned stimulus. It's an inborn uh, stimulus, something that you inborn react to that stimulus. For example, tapping the knee. The knee, knee tap is an unlearned stimulus. When that stimulus happens in the right spot, my knee kicks or my, my leg just kicks out. And that unconditioned stimulus causes my leg to kick out, which is the unconditioned response, UCR. Unconditioned. Unconditioned or unlearned response. Anytime that you see the word conditioning, put in learning, and it'll often clarify what you're trying to, to do here. That unconditioned stimulus is then connected to a conditioned stimulus. And that conditioned stimulus then causes the conditioned response. All right? Uh, let's take a look at Pavlov's dogs fairly quickly and plug that in, and then we'll go and look at a very practical application of the learning of phobias in Little Albert. If you look at Pavlov's dogs, you've seen this in the book undoubtedly, uh, several things happen. When you give a dog meat or dog powder in this particular case, what always happens when you put it in his mouth? If he's normal neurologically, he always salivates. Why? That's built in. It's the normal response to the meat powder because it's the beginning of breaking that meat powder down into usable energy and resources for the dog's body. So we have an unconditioned stimulus, which is a dog powder, which triggers the unconditioned response, which is salivation. And Pavlov got into measuring it and all kinds of stuff, which we don't really need to do. Well, in this case, Pavlov would uh, ring a bell, give dog powder, ring a bell, give dog powder, ring a bell, give dog powder. So our conditioned stimulus is ring a bell, is a bell. So they ring a bell, give dog powder, ring a bell, give dog powder. After just a few pairings, four, five, six, seven pairings, what happened after ringing a bell? Well, the dog had a condition response, which was salivation. And that's the pattern. Now, that sounds esoteric. It sounds, well, big deal. Why would anybody do that? Hopefully, they didn't spend our government funds doing it. No, they didn't. It happened in Russia. But look at a lot of these studies, because by chance, this study, which made no sense at all, you know, what, are we going to get dog spit therapy out of this? <laughs> uh, what it ended up with is, yes, we did. We got one of the most incredibly effective therapies in psychology today, and it taught us how to treat phobias. So let's take a look at that. Uh, there was a psychologist in the early 1900s who was one of the most famous psychologists of all time. You may not have heard of him. He didn't get the press that Freud did. But his name was John B. Watson. John B. Watson was quite a character. He'd actually done some sex research in his career that got him into a great deal of trouble. Sex is obviously a very hot topic. And one of the things he wanted to do was to trace the male and female physiological responses during the sex act. So being a scientist, he got his female lab assistant to cooperate with him. And they had sex, and they wired themselves up and kept records. Watson's wife found out, didn't think this was particularly funny, didn't think it was particularly scientific, went to the department. He got fired from his prestigious job and basically died in humiliation later. But John D. Watson, nonetheless, was groundbreaking in lots of areas. One of those areas he was groundbreaking in was this 
looking uh, at the application of classical conditioning to little kids, to human beings. And he had a little boy, and this is talked about in, in most textbooks, named Little Albert. And Little Albert was brought in, and they know that little kids have a fear response. In fact, it's a startle reflex. You've got a young child, and you come up behind them, and you make a loud noise, they don't see you coming, their arms go back like this. They go back like that. They arch their back, their arms go back. It's a, just as much an unconditioned response as the dog salivating to meat powder. Well, what Watson uh, did was he would uh, sound a loud noise by hitting a steel bar with a hammer, and the kid would go into the startle reflex. Well, he then gave the little kid a white rat. And I've seen movies of this actually, the actual, actual, not a redone of it, redo of it, but the actual movie itself of the original experiment. And the white rat was played with by Little Albert. Little Albert liked it, he wasn't afraid of it, he thought this was funny, he went, <coughs> had a good time playing with the white rat. And so in comes John B. Watson. John B. Watson says, okay, let's try and see if classical conditioning will work in this manner. Now, this study was probably would be considered unethical today. I mean, no doubt it would be considered unethical. But at that time, it was not considered unethical. And we actually did learn a great deal from it. So what happened was Watson came in. He set up the situation. And every time that he presented little Albert with the white rat, boom, made a loud noise. White rat, boom, made a loud noise. White rat, boom. After very few pairings, I think it was seven pairings, if I remember the original study, after very few pairings, the white rat would be shown and a fear response, the startle response would occur. Now let's go through and, and, and analyze this from classical conditioning. What is our unconditioned stimulus? The UCS. What is that? The unconditioned unlearned stimulus? Well, in this case, it's the loud sound. Then they have a UCR. What was that? The unconditioned response, loud sound, boom. Startle response, or fear. So we've got loud sound, and that causes fear, just perfectly natural. But then it was, they presented the white rat, loud sound, white rat, loud sound, white rat, loud sound. The white rat then is presented by itself. What happens? Well, you're right, it caused the baby to be afraid. So the baby then, Every time the white rat was presented, uh, became afraid. So the white rat was the conditioned stimulus, or the learned stimulus. He wasn't afraid of it before. Now he is. That caused the conditioned response, which was fear. What we've just done is systematically taught the world's first uh, scientific version of a phobia. Thank God it wasn't your kid or my kid that had this study done on them. We wouldn't be very happy about it. But what did it teach us? If phobias, which are debilitating to perfectly intelligent people, if phobias, which are irrational fears, can be learned, what's that mean? They ought to be able to be unlearned. Well, uh, if we take that a step further, how could we unlearn such a thing? How could we teach little Albert not to be afraid? Several different methods, but one method is called systematic desensitization. Systematic desensitization. And systematic means step by step. I don't know if you saw the corny Bill Murray movie, What About Bob, but you know the book Baby Steps. This is where they got this idea, is this baby steps of changing things a little bit at a time. And they were doing that more from an operant conditioning point of view. But systematic desensitization is from a classical conditioning point of view. So what do you do in systematic desensitization? One, you teach relaxation, which sounds incredibly simple. But it's actually not. Most people take a fair amount of time to learn how to relax different muscle groups on cue. Our anxiety lands in different parts of our body, and if we can learn to relax different muscle parts on cue, then we might be able to become less anxious. And indeed, we can become less anxious. So for some people, it takes a few weeks or a few months to learn systematic relaxation. And then the next thing is make a, a list of fears, things that bug you, things that you have phobias of. 
And some of those will be very strong and some of those will be very weak. Number three, make a hierarchy of those fears from the least threatening to the most threatening. So if he's afraid of, of uh, white rats, he generalized that to be also, by the way, afraid of Santa Claus beards, John B. Watson's hair, furry coats. So if he had a whole list of things, some things would be more similar to the original white rat and he'd be more afraid of them. Some things would be more distant and he'd be a little afraid of them. So you make a hierarchy of those fears from the least fear producing to the most fear producing and which one do you think we're going to start with? We're taking little bitty baby steps, right? We're going to try to systematically desensitize them to it. So we teach them relaxation and we start, number four, start with the least fear producing. So if little Albert were an adult coming in for therapy from the horrendous study that John B. Watson did on him, uh, and he might be afraid of uh, you know, uh, white shirts, but not nearly as much as he's afraid of white furry things. So you might start with white shirts, and you teach him how to be completely relaxed, control his breathing, be completely low on anxiety, while being around a white shirt or touching a white shirt. Next thing might be he was afraid of white uh, Santa Claus beards, a little bit more than white shirts. If he did the white shirt thing okay, you'd teach him relaxation and he'd practice hour after hour being totally relaxed around white Santa Claus beards. Now what would happen if he started getting tense and scared? Well, you take him a step back and you put him back on the things he was least afraid of. And then you back up the Santa Claus beards, then you're back up to the white furry coat, and then you're finally back to the white rat, and you've done this in tiny step-by-step -step processes. So you start with the least fear-producing and move to the most fear-producing. And that systematic desensitization is a 90% plus effective therapy for a very debilitating human disorder called being phobic. It's helped lots and lots of people, including several people I know, and in fact I've used it. Uh, in therapy with people in northern Michigan. Thank you very much.